everyone. Um, my name is uh, Gabriella Leva Stein, and I'm the Vice President of Programming for the Society of Research and Adolescents. And I'm just really excited for you to join us today on our webinar, Thinking Long Term about Adolescents and the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're really excited to share uh, the information that we have today. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, all mics are muted for the best viewing experience, but please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions to today's presenters. Um, it, we, we do follow that and you can upvote questions that you wanna answer first. So make sure to have that Q&A open so that we um, hear from you. Um, we will also be um, using, if you're wanting to live tweet, um, the hashtag SRA COVID-19. So live tweet what you learn um, and share with others what we're talking about today. So I'm very excited to introduce our president, Dr. Velma McBride-Murray, who is the Louis Audrey Betts Chair of Education and Human Development and Professor of the Department of Human and Organizational Development at Vanderbilt University. And I'm also excited to say congratulations as she was just newly elected to the National Academy of Medicine yesterday. So thank you, Velma. Uh, thank you, Gabby, and uh, it's it's a delight to be here. I was just saying to the team that you see here that this was just an idea a few week, a few months ago, and so I want to start by saying a special appreciation to Dr. Gabby Stein, who oversees many of the programmatic issues and uh, projects at SRA for the structuring of this webinar, and she has worked in collaboration with the operational management of SRA's headquarters staff. Under, under the direction of Jen Bridges, who is the SRA's uh, executive director, and also to my wonderful colleagues that have graciously given of their time to be part of this historical global connecting webinar. One of my platform goals as president of SRA is to elevate SRA to be one of the premier organizations and societies that connects both national and international research that involves adolescent development. I took on the helm of this presidency during the beginning of the COVID-19 and a time when we saw escalated shifts, life altering patterns impacting the life of families and communities around the world. That COVID-19 is a universal experience suggests the need to form global unifying efforts among scholars, policymakers, practitioners and families who are responsible for raising our generation of youth. We wanted to set a global agenda to examine the impact of this life-changing event on the developmental trajectories of adolescents around the world. I set forth this mission by contacting leadership of the International Consortium of Developmental Science Societies, which includes representatives from 12 societies that are both US linked as well as internationally linked. And I wanted to gauge their interest in launching a global collaboration to document the impact of COVID-19 on adolescents around the world. As I view this event will impact and influence their life course of this particular cohort. Similar to the impact of the Great Depression uh, that occurred in the US and then the historic 1918 influenza Spanish flu that was a, also a global pandemic. So the process began with emailing exchanges between me and the 12 societies, introducing the idea, informing them that I had four overarching goals. One was to evaluate resources already in place that could be leveraged, such as studies that were already underway, and, and that we could highlight those studies as we began to think about ways to document the impact of this life course event on uh, youth around the world. I also wanted to identify research scholars who may be interested in forming collaborations because I really view this as the beginning of many projects to come. Uh, and then I wanted to create a set of brief measures for those uh, investigators interested in collaborating to see whether or not they would be interested in adding this to a new or existing study that they had already begun to implement in order for us to then begin to document these processes. And I wanted to create an infrastructure for integrating the findings to identify patterns that were emerging, protective as well as risk factors emerging for youth around the world 
as this cohort is experiencing COVID-19. And lastly, I wanted to identify platforms where we could begin to show the way in which we've collaborated on this global initiative to disseminate our findings, for example, through study summaries, collaborative publications, parallel analysis that we could conduct across these studies across the world, and then began to think about more sophisticated data pooling and harmonization projects. This is the launching of this idea. We are set forth today to begin to really seriously begin this global documentation of the life course developmental trajectory of adolescence in the spirit and in the season of COVID-19. And I am delighted to introduce Dr. Andrea Hassan, who is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I must say that Andrea sent me an email and said, Velma, what do you think? Shall we begin to look at whether or not people are studying COVID-19 in the US? And I said, it's an opportunity for a global initiative. I sincerely appreciate the major role that she has played in guiding this initiative, Andrea. Thank you so much, Velma. I really appreciate it. And I'm really delighted to be here and have the opportunity to talk about this and excited to see everybody who's logged on and maybe are logging on later to see where this is headed. My goal is to present the results today from a survey that we administered to memberships of both SRA and 12 partnering professional organizations that all include a focus on trying to understand adolescents. And this survey came about by trying to follow those objectives that Dr. McBride Murray just uh, outlined for us. And so our goal was, was really trying to understand the way that these professional organizations and their membership could come together to collaborate about understanding the impact of COVID-19 pandemic as it's impacting adolescents. And knowing that this was a global village question, we decided to launch a survey to really look at capacity that was already present in the membership of SRA and these different organizations. And the motivating question, I will see if I, I have the fancy technology to make this happen. Sorry, I'm learning, my training wheels are under me. My motivating question for this, that the small group came up with in trying to, to launch this capacity building survey is what are researchers already doing to understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on adolescents around the globe? And importantly, what's the potential for collaboration here? And as I walk through the results, I'm gonna invite you to ask yourself that question when you're looking at what we're learning about the people who responded to this initial probe to see what's already in the field. Because our goal here is not really for us to lead the collaboration, but to foster points of collaboration in a community of researchers engaged in this work. So let me tell you about what we've learned. The survey that we put out went live mid-July and ran for about a month. And in that time, we had 220 people respond to the survey. They came from all stages of the career. You can see that we have graduate students through senior scholars here. So there's a lot of interest clearly in this question. In addition, these researchers and scholars came from 30 different professional organizations. They reside in 27 countries. They do research in 60 different countries and they represent perspectives from 17 different disciplines. So there's great capacity here for us to draw on. This is a list of the organizations that they represent. And I won't go through them all, but I will note a couple of things. First, they come from different parts of the world. Some are global, some are more regional, some more national organizations. And some of them are immediately obvious that they do work relevant to studying adolescents, and some are less so, but also help us think about the reach that we can have. For example, the Research Society on Alcoholism is not really focused on adolescents, but does include a fair amount of research on understanding alcoholism in adolescents, which can be part of this initiative. So we want to think broadly about how we reach out and include people in what we're doing. In terms of where people come from, here are the countries of residence that people are reporting. You'll notice that they span Asia and Australia, Africa, Europe, South America, North America. 
and they are where people live um, who are responding to the survey. But if we ask where people are collecting data, you see a much broader um, set of countries here. And uh, I think I'm jiggling around here. I'm hoping that you're seeing this fine. These countries represent first uh, countries that are coming from low income backgrounds, middle income backgrounds, high income backgrounds. We see them wrapping around the globe. And this is a pretty exciting slide to me because it really does represent the potential that we have to understand the global impact of this pandemic. The disciplines that are represented, I think, are equally important because when you have a complex problem or a wicked problem, as my public health colleagues say, we really need to have multiple perspectives coming together. This isn't going to come out of one part of the disciplines, but they're really us coming together. So you have a high percentage of the respondents who are in psychology and human development and family studies, but we also have people representing perspectives from education, public health, from sociology and economics, psychiatry, medicine. We have methodologists, people interested in policy, the fields of communication, developmental science, recreation and leisure studies are all represented, as well as social work, peace studies, linguistics, and criminology. And so the potential for a multidisciplinary understanding is present. People are already at work. And remember, this data comes from a few months ago, from mid-July to August. About 40% of respondents were already in the field collecting data. About 20% were planning to start in the next three months. And so we assume that they're there at this point. Another over 20% are hoping to do so in the near future. And just under 15% are interested in doing so, but don't have plans at the moment. So a number of people, not surprisingly, are very excited for moving into this place. What are, uh, who are they studying? They're studying a number of different samples that are identified by the investigators. And some investigators have more than one sample. But about half of those who are already collecting data were planning to do so in the next three months, so about 190 folks, have pre-pandemic data. So are able to look at change over time in adolescent functioning from pre to post pandemic directly. The target populations include what uh, investigators defined as normative samples, just under half. About a little more than a quarter are defined as minority samples, and this is a global study, so minority is defined however the investigator sees that in the context of the um, region where the study is taking place. We also have at-risk populations, a small number that have students with disabilities and other target populations. And what's exciting to me about this slide is the potential to understand not just the global pandemic broadly, but how that differs across different populations that may be vulnerable to the impacts of the pandemic and associated crises. What we're learning about these populations is very broad and varied. We focused on five domains, and we find that over 70% of respondents have at least one study in which they're studying mental health and social emotional factors. We also have a large number looking at positive development and well being. Over 40% are studying academic outcomes at the point that we looked at these data and asked people to respond. And just under 30% are looking at physical health. But they're looking at a number of other things too like cognitive behaviors, risk behaviors, what's happening with sleep, school reentry, sexual development, brain development, civic engagement, and how people are using their time as other examples. So there's a wide section of different domains we can tap. Just to give an example of the potential for collaborative studies, I just wanted to take a look at how many studies we had to answer one question that I think is a common one people are asking right now, which is how do adolescents vary and how the COVID-19 stress exposures are impacting them related to the coping strategies they're using and how that's affecting mental health around the world. And we asked this question looking at the 190 studies that are in our database from this survey. Um, and this is, you know, respondents data. We have 184 respondents who have data where they are assessing COVID-19 related stress and are coping. Of those, we have 86 who are also, sorry, also looking at mental health, 79 that include adolescent assessments between 11 and 24, and of those 60 are normative samples. Over 40, I think it's 42, are at risk samples. That is a lot of samples to think about collaborating across. And as you can see, they also offer us the opportunity to move around the globe. We have Australia and Azerbaijan, nine different studies from Canada, 
Finland, Germany, Ireland, Italy, two studies from Canada, Kenya, six studies from the Netherlands, Poland, Romania, Spain, Turkey, and about 30 studies from the US. So this is one way of thinking about the capacity that we see in what people are already doing or are engaging in. But there will be other ways to be involved, and Velma was talking about those as she introduced today's topic. But just in this one month snapshot of people interested in collaborating, we had 66 who were willing to share the surveys they're working on, 34 that have data sharing agreements in place, and some expertise in how you actually work in a collaborative framework, and over 158 interested in learning more about collaborations and getting involved. So to move us to thinking about how we take next steps, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Jennifer Lansford and have her talk about some of her work. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here today. And so rather than talking to you specifically about findings, um, I thought I would talk to you today about some methodological issues that we've been dealing with in the Parenting Across Cultures project um, that have to do with parents and late adolescents' responses to COVID-19 in nine countries. And I could have the next, there we go. Um, so the Parenting Across Cultures project team includes investigators from nine participating countries, and they're listed here. And this is a research team that's been working together um, since we launched initial data collection back in 2008. So we're long-term collaborators. And this slide shows the nine countries where we've been collecting data in this ongoing project. And those include China, Colombia, Italy, Jordan, Kenya, the Philippines, Sweden, Thailand, and the United States. And in terms of COVID, one of the interesting things about this sample is that if we had chosen countries a priori that would be interesting contexts for studying adolescents' responses to the pandemic, uh, we likely would have chosen some of these countries. And in terms of thinking about things like government, re government response to the pandemic, these countries have had very different responses. Sweden, for example, has been unusual in not having the same kinds of widespread lockdowns that many other countries have had. Other countries had quick responses with um, very controlled lockdowns. Others have been more variable. So these are widely different contexts in which to study responses to the COVID pandemic. So our research participants include over 1,400 families who had eight-year-old children on average when we initially recruited the sample back in 2008. And the samples were recruited from schools that were serving socioeconomically diverse uh, families in each of the sites. The samples in each um, site include only 100 families. These are not nationally representative samples. They're locally representative. In some places like the United States, we have roughly 100 African-American, roughly 100 European-American, and roughly, roughly 100 Latinx families. Um, in some of the other countries, we had um, a couple of different data collection sites, but these are not nationally representative samples. Um, we've now been following the fam families annually for 12 years, and the participants are now 19 to 20 years old on average. So in general, our procedures involve procedures of translation and back translation of measures. And we go through a process of cultural adaptation of measures to make sure that the questions are culturally appropriate and sensitive in each of the contexts. We get informed consent from parents and now the late adolescents. Um, we do interviews each year with adolescents and their mothers and fathers. We've conducted in-person interviews in previous years, but now with the pandemic, this has all been um, online. We've used Qualtrics quite a lot, and that has a very user-friendly interface. In some of our countries, um, that's a burden on people's data plans. And so we've had a Facebook Messenger option, which might be useful for folks um, to know about. This was something that it's a little bit clunkier to use. So if you have a very long survey, it may not work as well. But um, for shorter measures, it can be really handy and has the advantage of not being um, a burden on people's data plans, at least in some countries. We developed a measure of experiences related to COVID-19. It's a short measure, it's about 19 items and it takes less than five minutes to administer. 
And uh, we have this available in Qualtrics and translated into nine languages already. We're happy to share this link if anybody is just looking for kind of a starting point with, um, with a measure of experiences related to COVID-19. It asks questions about things like optimism regarding the future res uh, resolution of the pandemic and confidence in government's response, um, whether it's been easy to comply with virus containment recommendations, levels of disruption to daily routines, work and family life, um, changes in internalizing and externalizing behavior, substance use, sleep, and other factors like family relationships during the pandemic. And I'll direct you to this site. This is the US National Institutes of Health um, Toolkit of COVID Measures. And this is a really handy website. Um, if you go to this site, you can click on links to topics um, that are wide ranging. They include violence and substance use, mental health, a number of other issues. So if you click on a specific topic, it'll take you to um, a list of measures that um, are about that particular topic. And these are all freely available measures. And so if you have a particular interest in studying, say, violence in relation to the pandemic, um, these are, are some measures that you might want to check out. I thought it would be useful to spend a couple minutes talking about some methodological challenges that we've been facing because these are, um, are questions that others may be encountering as well. So one question we've dealt with has to do with rating scales, especially during the context of the pandemic. Um, the question becomes, how do you want to frame the change? So in our 19 item measure, um, we asked people to subjectively report compared to before the pandemic, how sad are you? How um, angry are you? And so people are kind of in their own mind coming up with this, um, okay, so before the pandemic, I felt this, now I feel this. That's, that's certainly one way of approaching it. Um, another thing that you can do for those of you who have um, data that you collected before the pandemic and have the ability to collect data during or after the pandemic um, is to use the pandemic as sort of a natural experiment. And so for example, um, in our work, we had administered a measure of depression prior to the pandemic, and we'll be able to administer that measure again um, now during and after the pandemic. So in that case, we're not asking the participants to report on change. We're, you're, we're using those um, measures as um, to be able to compare before versus during versus after um, without asking them specifically to reflect in their own mind on change. Timing is another tricky issue. Um, what we've been doing so far, and there are no right or wrong answers um, to how to handle these things, and these are things we're kind of grappling with, but we've been controlling for the number of days since the um, onset of major government lockdowns in different countries. In most of the countries um, that we're working in, those government restrictions happened largely in mid-March. Um, and in most of the countries, there was a certain day where restaurants closed or schools closed. And so we're using that as kind of the onset date. Um, that becomes a little trickier over time because uh, many countries had restrictions and then re relaxed restrictions. And then as cases surged, many countries have implemented new restrictions. And so this is an ongoing challenge methodologically for how to handle these changes over time and government responses to the pandemic. And um, if there are certain um, methodological approaches that might offer some, some um, interesting possibilities. So for those of you who are able to use ecological momentary assessments or other very time sensitive um, kinds of assessment techniques that might be possible to try to assess in real time, um, some of these kinds of time changing um, experiences that people are having. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, I very much look forward to, um, to ongoing work uh, in this domain. And I would like to introduce the next presenter who is Dr. Makila Leonida from Kababi University in Kenya. Thank you for the opportunity on participating in this workshop on navigating long-term impact of COVID-19 on adolescents, the Kenyan scenario. Uh, the negativity caused by COVID-19 in Kenya can greatly be felt across uh, the African continent and Kenya specifically, especially on how it affects the vulnerable adolescent youth. 
COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown has brought about a sense of fear and anxiety around the globe. This phenomenon has led to short-term as well as long-term psychosocial and mental health implications, not only for children but also for adolescents. The quality and magnitude of impact on adolescents is determined by many vulnerable factors like developmental age, educational status, adolescents who have pre-existing mental conditions, being economically underprivileged, and being quarantined due to infection or fear of infection. The home confine confinement of children and adolescents is associated with uncertainty and anxiety, which is attributable to disruption in the education, physical activities, and opportunities for socialization. Absence of structure setting of the school for a long duration result in disruption in routine, boredom, and lack of innovative ideas for engaging in various academic and ex extracurricular activities. Adolescents have wasted a great deal of time by not covering the syllabus. Being away from school, they have been polarized from constant supervision and were homebound, exposed to all forms of psychosocial derailments, majorly sex, addictions to pornography, alcohol, drug abuse, etc. This can be explained by the skyrocketing number of teenage pregnancies in Kenya that is very alarming. What are the long-term implications? One, social emotional challenges such as fear, anxiety. Adolescents are prone to all these psychosocial, uh, psycho, uh, uh, social and emotional challenges. And uh, this is as a result of the state of uncertainty they find themselves in. And these uh, psychosocial challenges lead to behavioral problems such as it, developing eating disorders, feeling so agitated, increased conflicts, delinquent behavior, poor concentration because of uncertainty. It also leads to increased psychiatric disorders such as post-traumatic stress. Most ad adolescents are finding themselves in with PTSD, uh, depression, anxiety disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, as well as grief-related symptoms. Adolescents with psychiatric disorders are at risk of a break in change in their care and management. What will be most important to understand, one, psychological interventions need to be increased to alleviate anxiety and other disorders. The government to plan strategies to enhance adolescents' access to mental health services during and even after the current crisis. We need a increased awareness in Kenya for adolescents to learn responsibility, accountability, involvement, and collaboration. A lot of sensitization programs to empower local communities, societies, individuals across different ages through research, training, and counseling. Parents need to be empowered through psychosocial uh, programs to, to model appropriate preventive measures and coping mechanisms. And schools need to come up with supportive programs uh, to help the adolescents, such as peer interaction programs in order to improve their social skills. I uh, thank you for listening to me. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Josefa Kunha of Federal University of Parana in Brazil to continue with his presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Today, I'd like to speak about the impact of COVID-19 among Brazilian youth. I was an adolescent in Brazil in the late 80s, a period that came to be called the last decade. My generation saw Brazil make huge strides, and I'm here today hoping that these advancements will continue. Since 2010, Brazil has seen the peak years of its youth bulge, and there are still large gaps to enhance adolescent development in Brazil, especially through research that uses a positive approach to youth development. Even before the pandemic, Brazilian adolescents were under pressure due to the lingering effects of the 2008 recession and the large proportion of youth still lack access to education and work, leading to a number of predictable consequences at the individual and societal level. Now, as the COVID-19 pandemic ravages through communities in Brazil, it follows patterns of inequity deeply embedded in our society. For example, the risk of death from COVID-19 is 62% higher for Black people in Brazil. Unfortunately, the pandemic doesn't come along as a threat to Brazilian youth. Black, 
indigenous, LGBTQ, and other marginalized youth are likely to bear the largest brunt of the pandemic because of systematic and structural inequities. Will this intersection between a youth boat, a recession, and the pandemic lead to a lost generation in Brazil? Our work can contribute to avoid this outcome so that youth can survive and flourish even through this stressful period. A core issue is to enhance indicators of youth development with special attention to the experiences of marginalized population, such as LGBTQ youth, so that the vicious cycles of inequities can be addressed. More specific issues that require our urgent work include academic resilience and understanding how lessons are engaging with remote and online learning in low resource settings. Civic development is also increasingly important in a polarized society. We have the prevention of violence and the promotion of healthy relationships in families and communities should also be integrated into the agenda. Further coordination is needed to orient that these advancements in knowledge are made available through local and global cooperation networks to inform policy and program development. Youth are ready to be part of the solution and need to be engaged in responses to these generational challenges. Advancing programs and policies that enhance adolescent development should be prioritized during and after the pandemic. We shouldn't accept a world where so many youth are left behind. This can be accomplished by open approaches to advancing research. Our contribution is urgently needed and our cooperation is key in Brazil and around the world. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Suman Verma from Punjab University in India. We will continue this session. Thank you. My greetings to all. At the outset, I would like to congratulate Velma and her team for this great initiative. My thanks to Jen for inviting me to this seminar, webinar to share my thoughts. I begin with the impact of the pandemic on adolescents in India. India with close to 7,400,000 cases is second on the global radar. The threat of the second wave looms large. The number of people who are food and nutrition insecure is rapidly expanding. Young people have faced loss of job, mass migration, with depleting household resources. And this has resulted in sharp surge in child labor and child trafficking. Quarantine, isolation, and traumatic bereavement is leading to post-traumatic stress disorders among young people. Due to disruption of life-saving interventions, many more adolescents could die from treatable and preventable conditions. Access to education, food, and health services has been dramatically affected. 27% school children deprived of online learning due to lack of smartphones, laptop, internet connections, electricity connections. The government is taking remedial measures to deal with the pandemic. I now move on to the multifaceted developmental impacts on adolescents, some key issues. The harmful effects of this pandemic will not be distributed equally. They are expected to be most damaging for young people in already disadvantaged or vulnerable situations. The potential losses that may accrue in learning for today's young generation and for the development of the human capital are of great concern. Exclusion experiences are on the rise for mainstream social institutions. Young have experiencing shifting of work opportunities in the informal and formal economy, challenging their skill set. The current economic crisis trends across countries project medium to long-term risk to young people and their families, which may impede the sustainable development goals progress towards the 2030 deadline. 
some thoughts for collaborative understanding and research. Systematic interdisciplinary research and cross-national comparisons are needed to document the pathways marginalized adolescents adopt during and post-pandemic phase. Document the distinct economic, social, and cultural circumstances arising due to the pandemic that will push young people to the margins of the societies and inhibit their psychosocial development. Examine intermediate and long-term impacts that both COVID-19 and its infections control measures have on adolescent developmental outcomes in relation to the changes in the opportunities and constraints young people encounter in the key institutions that structure and organize their lives. Understand the varying importance of family, school, and labor market factors in schooling decisions and outcomes across countries and across social groups with a focus on age and gender gaps to shed light on the main drivers of adolescent vulnerability. Finally, capture voices of youth and their perspective on coping with the social and developmental challenges of the present times. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Nini Wu from the Guangdong University of Education in China. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Nini Wu from mainland China. Thanks for the invitation of Dr. Lansford. I'm so glad to share my viewpoint about the influence of COVID-19 on Chinese adolescents. As suggested, I will discuss the following two questions. First, let me introduce the background in China. In China, more than 200 million children and adolescents are confined to their homes due to COVID-19. This includes 180 million primary and secondary students. Such confinement influences adolescents. The first is about their emotional adjustment. Many adolescents suffer more anxiety and depression than before, and the rate of students' suicide has been increasing recently. Especially in China, senior high school was a very risk factor for a mental health problem. The higher the grade, the greater the prevalence of depression and anxiety symptoms. The reason might be, in traditional Chinese culture, education is highly valued and regarded as the main path to success. And these students are put under great pressure to prepare for this national college entry examination. For the students who did not perform well during the exam, they may face more difficulties for school adjustment after entry university. The second is about behavioral adjustment. According to my interview of some middle school teachers, more and more adolescents became a internet addicted or mobile phone addiction during or even after the confinement. For example, they involve in online relationship and develop invisible boyfriend or girlfriend. And they don't have motivation to learn. They became academic procrastination. Also, such confinement caused many conflicts between parents and children, like many other countries. Um, and also, the confinement enlarged the gap between the rural urban students, which might be uh, the unique phenomenon in China. In China, left, they are left having children whose parents were in the city and they were raised by their grandparents. And this family suffered from poverty without sources of stable income. This disadvantage made them more vulnerable to mental health problems. And they experience more pressure, anxiety, and uh, depends. Finally, I want to talk about the positive influence of COVID-19. Before COVID-19, most of the adolescents in China like the singer star or film star and take them as their idol. However, man, many students take Dr. John Nanshan as their idols after uh, the COVID-19. Dr. John is an uh, experienced epidemiologist and physician. He contributes a lot to control the COVID-19. He is also a hero when resists SARS. His famous saying is, bringing all critically ill patients to me. And the second one uh, question I want to 
uh, discuss is what would be the most important to understand. I think psychological intervention should be prioritized to help vulnerable senior high school students and adolescents in rural China, especially left behind. Also, parents um, can be the role models in healthy behavior for children. And they also need to monitor children's behavior, help them to develop disciplined behaviors. Uh, also, instead of blaming children, parents need to respect their children's needs and understand why children involve some problem behavior. Finally, school is also encouraged to offer opportunities for students to interact with teachers and attain psychological counseling, encourage physical activities, and etc. Okay, that's all for my talk today. Now I'd like now to introduce Dr. Susan Brenner, Professor of Adolescent Development at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. In this flash talk, I will address the long-term implications of COVID-19 for adolescents in Europe. Since the beginning of this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a major impact in Europe. Currently, the numbers of infections are rapidly rising again, and in response, most governments have reinstalled the lockdown and distancing measures. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a major impact on the lives of all adolescents. Many adolescents worry and have anxiety about the health of themselves, their family members and friends. Moreover, many adolescents had to stay at home, had to attend school from home and had limited contact with peers. The social structured activities were often cancelled. Social interactions and peer relations are of major importance for adolescents and have an important role in the development of their personality, identity and perspective. Day. Initial findings so far suggest that adolescents, however, seem to deal fairly well with the circumstances. A study from England showed that anxiety and depression decreased during the pandemic. There were increases in well-being and school connectedness and no changes in family connectedness and peer connectedness. A Dutch study showed that the COVID lockdown somewhat decelerated a longitudinal decrease in early adolescent internalizing and externalizing symptoms. Parental overreactivity decreased as well, yet parental psychological symptoms significantly increased during the COVID pandemic. Our own work showed that parental involvement and parental support decreases during the pandemic, but negative interaction decreases as well, suggesting that daily tensions might decrease, but parents and adolescents are careful not to let these evolve into conflicts. Most adolescents in Europe continue to do their schoolwork online from home and can reach out to their peers and friends to virtual platforms. These findings suggest that under these circumstances, having more time together as a family also produces developmental benefits. Particularly, adolescents from more disadvantaged and lower income environments experience a negative impact of the pandemic. They experience loss of family income, higher rates of illness and deaths among family members and community members, and problems in virtual connectivity. The level of stress and trauma in these adolescents is also higher. Economic insecurity is consistently linked to adverse developments, academic achievements, health outcomes, and risk for exposure to violence. Perceived stress seems to be a significant factor in the effects of COVID-19. Adolescents who reported more externalizing behaviors prior to the lockdown experienced more stress during the lockdown, which was subsequently related to a larger increase in externalizing behaviors during the lockdown. Also, adolescents who experience high stress and use more active coping reported a larger decrease in involved parenting during the lockdown. Thus, adolescents experience more COVID-19 related stress might be at risk for negative consequences of the COVID-19 lockdown. To better understand the impact of COVID-19 on adolescent development, we need longitudinal studies with assessments before, during and after COVID-19. Also, chronic stress has different impacts in different phases of the stressor, starting with alarm, resulting in resistance and adaptation to exhaustion. And therefore, we need multiple measures during the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to compare different age cohorts so that we can compare normative developmental changes with developmental changes due to COVID-19. And we need mixed method studies with qualitative in-depth studies to find the relevant factors in diverse samples. 
Together, these studies will increase our understanding of which adolescents are more vulnerable to the COVID-19 related stressors and why. I now like to introduce Dr. Fosso Motto Stefanidi, Professor of Psychology at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens in Greece. Hello, everyone. I would like to start by thanking Professor Velma McBride Murray for inviting me at this very exciting event that uh, the Society for Research on Adolescence is organizing. I will talk today about a multi-system approach to resilience among youth in the context of COVID-19. COVID-19 is a disaster that was waiting to happen. Professor Michael Osterholm from the University of Minnesota wrote in 2005 in a, in a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that pandemics are inevitable and that outbreaks can be devastating and could stop the world in its tracks. In spite of such warnings by a number of specialists, many countries, even affluent ones, were caught off guard by the disaster caused by the pandemic 19, COVID-19. COVID-19 is considered to be a disaster because it has suspended normal activities and threatens or causes severe worldwide damage. It threatens the health and survival of individuals and disrupts their lives. However, it is a multi-system disaster since it also disrupts nearly every system that is essential or supportive of children and youth's well-being and development. It affects family life and routines, work, education, healthcare, etc. The responses to the pandemic of individuals, families, schools, communities, and countries are interdependent. The management of the pandemic by governments may have negative ca cascading consequences on countries' economies and on countries' healthcare systems. So whether a government uh, takes measures like lockdowns, full or partial, restricts movement of the population, uh, that may have make a difference for how their economies and healthcare system will fare. If you lock down society, uh, if you restrict people's movement, that will have a negative cascading effect on economies and that will be severely felt by some people because they will be unemployed and some families will actually move to the poverty level. However, if you don't do uh, these measures, if you don't implement them, the country's healthcare systems will suffer because it often will come to the brink of breakdown with many people sick, many people needing ICUs. So less ability to care for these people, more death, which will trigger in individual children and parents fear, stress, uncertainty, and grief. In this context, family have to deal with economic stress, unemployment, loss of supports, and they also need to find a new work-life balance when, with their children at home, demands are rising and supports are falling. On the other hand, schools and teachers also somehow need to figure out how to teach and bond with students from a distance, how to maintain school culture, student engagement and belonging from a distance, and how to maintain important ceremonies during the pandemic. In this wider context, youth deal with worries about or loss of family members and friends, stressed and possibly depressed parents, disruption in their everyday routines, closing of schools, camps, sports, and other extracurricular activities, online education, loss of time and opportunities to be with friends, less independence and more monitoring by parents, and lost opportunities and disappointments uh, related to internships, adventures, and job prospects. These multi-level and cascading challenges raise, raise obstacles to the achievement uh, of the developmental tasks that youth need to address. So they may put stress on their relationship with parents, teachers, peers. They require that young people stay motivated and engaged in their education, which takes place in a very unusual uh, circumstance. 
These challenges may lead to emotional symptoms in youth, such as fear, anxiety, depression, frustration. However, in spite of these challenges, significant individual differences are expected in the way youth will deal with the pandemic. Some will show resilient adaptation, whereas others will falter. So the question arises, who adapts well during such a disaster caused by the pandemic and why? There are three parameters that make a difference. First of all, the duration of the disruption and the extent of loss caused by COVID-19 are important because as time passes, well, the individual's surge capacity diminishes. Cumulative risk is important because the more risks exist in one's life, uh, this makes the negative effect of the pandemic on families and children worse. So for example, financially uh, strained families or socially disadvantaged families are more vulnerable and have few resources to defend against the threat and stress caused by the pandemic. Developmental timing matters because the effects of COVID-19 are expected to vary by age. So for example, younger children may not understand the, ex the extent of the disruption and the destruction and its implications for the future whereas adolescents have more resources as a result of brain development and experience, but they also have more exposure than younger children. Youth's proximal social context, such as their families and schools, matter. How well youth will depend, will do, depends to a significant degree on the resilient functioning of their proximal context, which in turn is influenced by how well the country manages the challenges resulting from the pandemic. The pandemic tends to destabilize not only individuals, but also their proximal context, such as their school and families, as well as their country. However, families and teachers who are in the front line in dealing with children and youth, and who often play a protective role in their lives, may be themselves significantly challenged by the added stresses caused by the pandemic. You see here a figure inspired from Bronfenbrenner's biological, mo uh, biological model of human development. You can see that the individual is nested in, co in social context. During COVID-19, individuals in all levels of context um, are affected by the pandemic. How well individual children and young people will do during these challenging times depends on the resilience in their families and schools, which has a direct impact on them. In turn, the way family and school systems respond to these challenges depends to a large extent on the, res on the resilience in society. So the policies, laws and decisions taken at the level of government uh, to address the challenges of the pandemic have an impact on the way schools and families will be able to cope and support their children, which in turn will have an effect on the way youth will handle these challenges. So the stress and disruption created by the pandemic is observed at all levels of context and resilience or in contrast problematic adaptation is also observed at all levels of context. Now, what are the implications of this multi-level resilience perspective for promoting positive adaptation of youth in the, COVID, in the context of COVID-19? A preponderant responsibility lies with governments to address efficiently the health, economic, and social challenges of the population, which are due to the pandemic. So the following provisions are important. First of all, governments need to act swiftly uh, and to manage this uh, public threat, uh, public health threat, threat uh, and to respond to it in a competent way. They need to clearly communicate uh, the need to take measures and to convince people. Governments need to provide free healthcare, economic relief, and emergency food provision to those who need it. Governments need to support parents' mental health and parenting capacity. 
So such, pro such provisions taken at the country level support parents so that they can support their children. Examples of resilience factors at the level of the family and the school that can be mobilized to protect the adaptation of youth in the context of disaster are close relationships, trust, belonging, cohesion, skilled family and school management, family and school problem solving and planning, family coherence, family school routines and celebrations, maintaining or restoring cultural practices and traditions. And these are classical protective factors that are important for when uh, youth and families experience adversity, but also they, they, they reflect the ordinary magic that Massin talks about, uh, which is those are important um, factors that promote positive adaptation also uh, under um, lower risk conditions. However, there are two, fact, two important factors that uh, uh, will protect youth, especially youth uh, that are from coming from the more vulnerable uh, part of the population, so such as ensuring internet access and technology uh, of low income families. Uh, these kids need to be able to connect uh, and in order to uh, further their education, to connect to the internet in order to further their education. But also we need to normalize opportunities for youth to be with friends and to learn. So some take home messages, COVID-19 is a disaster that has disrupted every system that is essential um, and that is supportive of children and youth's well-being and development. The negative effect of COVID-19 cascades from the societal level through youth's proximal context and places at risk their development and well-being. Youth's proximal context, which often function protectively for their adaptation in the context of adversity, in this case are themselves adversely affected by the pandemic. Families and schools need the appropriate supports to be able to support their children. An important source of support for them in these challenging times needs to come from good and effective governance. I would like to thank you for your attention. And now we will open the discussion of next steps. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Jordan, for moving us along here. Uh, we're coming to the end, and I want to make a few comments as we are, are wrapping up some of the discussion for today. Um, I'm sure you share my gratitude for everybody who provided comments as we move around the globe and thinking about the issues coming up for trying to understand the impact on of adolescents on um, how they're responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. A few things to note. First, the effort to understand the global impact of COVID-19 is clearly already underway. More work is gonna follow, and that's particularly as it pertains to the long-term implications on adolescent development, which is where I believe this collaborative nature of what we're trying to build here can really make a difference. Through coordinating our efforts and ongoing conversations, we can learn from one another, share resources, and gain a more informed understanding of those long-term implications that are gonna vary over time, place, and person to the emerging measurement archives that are already out there, coordinated studies, special issues, manuscript libraries, we can add a focus on adolescence and pulling those resources together to understand these long-term implications. And this opportunity might also propel us toward an even higher goal of integrating the global research community in adolescent research around a singular, highly focused, important topic. So to that end, there is a link in the chat. There's a link on the screen that you can see, which is our next step survey. And we invite you to go ahead and take that now. It is less than a minute to let us know if you're interested in uh, keeping tabs on this um, particular collaboration. So hearing about it through listserv or ways that you want to get involved. So please take a look at that and let us know that you're out there and that you're interested so we can grow that community and keep you engaged. And with that, I will stop and see if there are other questions out there, particularly if we have youth who are listening in and want to add their voices and say, hey, you might have missed something. So we invite all comments and questions at this time. And I turn that over to Jennifer. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, 
We had a question um, earlier on when Dr. Bronye was talking about whether um, they have found changes in sleep of adolescents in, in Europe. Um, and I, I'm not, I, I don't know that we have the capacity to have Dr. Bronye answer um, specifically, um, but Gabby provided a link to Dr. Bronye's paper that hopefully um, we'll have that information. Um, I think sleep, um, we've, that's, that's certainly been a, a big issue. And I, at least in our data, um, we've found it going in both ways. Some reports of more sleep problems um, that might be tied to things like anxiety, but also um, some people reporting that, that they're sleeping more now, I think maybe because they were more confined to home and so not having as many competing demands on time. So that might be an area where there are actually some benefits, but also some some negative effects of the pandemic. Um, but I, I welcome other um, questions or, or comments along those lines. Dr. Brenier just sent a message to us. Uh, thank you, Susan. And she did not include it, unfortunately. Thank you, Velma. Um, so there are there are a couple of suggestions um, in the Q and A about the open science framework, and I think um, that's a that's a great way for people um, interested in moving forward this to share resources. And so um, um, I think that that as a as a group as we figure out ways to move forward, that's something that we can definitely make use of. Um, there's another question here. I was wondering whether research is examining adolescents' use of social media to maintain peer relationships and has use increased, which is a great question. Does anyone want to jump in with an answer to that one? Susan, I invite you to jump in here too as somebody who's actively engaged in that research. I was excited to see you in the chat. Um, I know there are people gathering this data. I haven't seen this data um, coming coming out uh, in a way that I could answer that question. That's that's my sense too. I, I think that's a, an area that is really ripe for more research. Um, and it's an important, a really important question that I don't have a good answer to either. I think this is pointing to areas where we can go. And there's a lot of that that's coming out of the different um, talks that we heard from our presenters from around the globe. And I think a number of people are trying to think about what those next steps should be in a really concrete way. So please make sure you fill out that survey so that we can, can follow up with you. We are also really aware that there are a lot of efforts in place. There are measurement archives that are present, open science networks that are already forming. And so our goal isn't to repeat and duplicate effort that's already out there, but to add to that. Um, Susan, you're here. Do you want to make any comments since we got you live and unmuted? Yes, sorry. It took me some while to reconnect. I was thrown out of the meeting and reconnected. Um, yeah, maybe just to comment about the question about social media. We did include that as well because we are also thinking that that has an important maybe promoting factor in staying connected. And we, are, we don't have results yet, but we are analyzing that. So I would love also to collaborate on that with other researchers. Fantastic, yes. I, I see another question that's kind of in that same vein about uh, uh, is anyone involving TikTok involvement, especially young adolescents? I haven't seen it yet. I, I will say I have been doing TikToks with my adolescents, so I'm not sure it's just the adolescents who are involved in the TikTok experience at this point, as families are all together. Um, and it's interesting to think about that social media usage as actually not being individual uh, engagement, but as family engagement as well, um, that you see that happening a little bit. And so it'd be interesting to see what we could learn. We have someone who's who has responded to the social media question, which is really interesting, saying that um, that their preliminary COVID-19 research on social media has shown that adolescents are using social media in more creative ways to connect with others, but also finding ways to disconnect. Um, 
and also had the tip that TikTok was the number one most downloaded app in the first quarter of 2020. So really interesting. Clearly an area for fruitful research and a very important one to think about globally as there's so many ways that that changes as we move around the world. I think we're probably coming to the end, folks. And um, I'm just really, again, thank Dr. McBride Murray for giving um, us all the opportunity to gather and start this conversation and really hope that you take time to put your name and contact information into that survey so we can follow up with you. There are so many ways to connect and so many people doing this work um, and being able to understand the extent to which that's really helping us understand what's happening and as a contextual question, what's happening in our places and with our people and how that varies is so important. So I invite you to stay in touch with us. And I think that that's where we're gonna end today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and thanks. Thank Thanks to the Jen and Andrea. This was wonderful. Susan, it's great to see you. <laughs>